You dig what I'm saying? And just the thought of that, with me getting this far, and to fall off and not keep really serious and passionate about this, like this is my life. And that's the motivation right there. Kendrick would turn that motivation into motion and start to record songs as early as 16 years old while he was still in high school. Kendrick went by the rap name K-Dot. He dropped his first mixtape in April of 2003 called The Youngest H&IC Volume 1. The mixtape floated around and it managed to get into the right hands. Before and um, I'm like 16, I had a local mixtape out, Hub City Threat, you know, and um, Top Dog heard it, brought me in the studio, I locked in with Rock immediately, and uh, it was just us two, working, working. Started with the mid, Rock got signed, was pushing me. Kada signed to TDE, which stands for Top Dog Entertainment. The label was started back in 2004. On one hand, that's a major blessing, but on the other hand, this isn't like signing to a major record label like Cash Money or Rockefeller Records, where you get a million dollar advance and a diamond chain. Signing to an up and coming label meant you had to get it out of the mud. K-Dot and J-Rock were the first two artists signed to TDE. J-Rock used to come to K-Dot's high school, so they already knew each other. And the bonus was that having two artists sign at the same time, they weren't alone on their journey, and they could go through the growing pains together as new artists. J-Rock would get to work early, dropping his first mixtape in June of 05. And Kada will release a second tape in May the next year called Training Day. J Rock and Kada really had a synergy that sounded like they were rapping together for years. Both artists had two distinctive styles, but meshed very well on every track they were on together. TD would stumble upon a young lyricist repping Carson by the name of Ab Soul. Just think of a newer version of Raskas. Absol was signed to TDE in 2007. A mixtape that will really set up J-Rock and K-Dot for victory and increase their buzz is the No Sleep to NYC mixtape. At the end of 2007, Dot and Rock would rhyme over classic East Coast beats and also West Coast beats. This was to show and prove that West Coast MCs could spit, and they, they would also bring out Ab Soul as well. This tape would raise the buzz of TDE and shine the light on the next up and coming West Coast MCs. 2008 would be the year when all the pieces of the puzzle would start to come together. TDE would sign a hungry, unknown MC out of LA named Q. Schoolboy Q was signed to TDE in 2008. This will be the beginnings of a dream team, also known as Black Hippie. Having four young MCs join a label at the same time is not only perfect for artist development, you have hungry MCs that can help you sharpen your sword lyrically, ideas get bounced around, and most of all, you get to join a brotherhood. This is something you can't get at the average record label. This would definitely help K-Dot grow as an artist. After several years of grinding, you're bound to hit a home run. Rock would be that guy with the grand slam. J-Rock would score a big hit with the hottest MC on the planet at the time, Lil Wayne, with the song called All My Life. This was not only important for J-Rock, TDE, but definitely for Kendrick. Seeing hits by other artists on other labels is one thing, but if it's the homie on the same label, you know your destiny is getting closer and closer. TD's buzz was super high at this point. Kada would come out early 2009 with his mixtape called C4. C4 is a play on words. It's basically Lil Wayne's Carter series, but this is C4, 
not Carter Three. Kendrick would also have a Lil Wayne inspired album cover for the mixtape. And then this mixtape will be full of songs that he was dropping over the Lil Wayne Carter Three beats. At this point, Kendrick was ready to move away from the mixtape rapper image. As at this point, he proved that he had bars. Kendrick was ready to become more of a songwriter. Right now, man, I'm pressing up this Kendrick Lamar mixtape. It's not a mixtape, it's actually an EP. 11 songs, original, all originals. Just basically trying to trying to get my story out there first and, and going with the name change or whatnot. You know, so just getting ready for that. Back at your shit as K-Dot, feels like when you change your name to Kendrick Lamar, mm -hmm. that's when a, a change happened in your career. Like you start to get noticed right. by different people and it was like you took a different turn. Right. Was that intentional or is that something that just happened? Um, it, it came with developing myself and just growth as a person. You know I mean, as well as an artist, you know, K-Dot was the stage of me really finding my niche and finding myself. I came into this business wanting to be the best artist, the best rapper, you know, so I went and studied the greats, you know, the usual suspects, Tupac, Jay-Z, Nas, of course. And um, it was basically me finding my niche, taking pieces from their styles and putting it all into one, you know, and eventually practicing and getting better in the studio and working on my craft, I developed into my own. You know, and that, that's something that takes time. Kendrick will release the Kendrick Lamar LP in December of 2009. You can tell right away the difference in direction and what type of artist he was becoming. The transition was seamless. When I did the Kendrick Lamar EP, it had, it had more substance and more of me in it. And then um, I started, started to realize that the more I did that type of music, more people was relating to me. You know, it wasn't just, oh, you a tight rapper, you got a hundred bars and you're really dope. Right. It was more so, yo, you in these streets, these cat people in these streets are coming to me like, yeah, nigga, you doing something, you damn near changing my life. You dig know what I'm saying? Yeah. And from the point where I'm getting called from cats in the pen, OGs in the pen, like, yo, keep doing what you're doing because I'm not there for my son to... to to kick the type of shit that you kicking. You're not preaching. No, nope, right. you're not. You're kicking reality shit, but you're putting a twist on it at the end of the day, let them know that it's still real. You know what I'm saying? So that was my whole approach, man, and I ran with it because I felt more comfortable by doing it. It was my life and my life story and situations and experiences that I grew up around. With the critical success of the Kendrick Lamar LP, Kendrick Lamar knew he was headed in the right direction, so he would, be, he would begin to start working on his next mixtape. Overly Dedicated were released in September of 2010. This would be his most popular release up until this point. He would show a wide range of his potential on tracks like Growing Apart, Opposites of Track, and Barbed Wire. But he also still had the bangers like the song called Michael Jordan. Kendrick would land on the Double XL freshman cover in 2011. This was huge as this really opened up a bigger demographic and a larger hip hop audience. A lot of people that have never heard of Kendrick Lamar up until this point got a chance to see him on a Double XL cover. This cover also featured fellow Compton MC YG. Kendrick was now primed and ready to record his debut album, Section 80. He was no longer a local MC. He no longer had to grind the mixtape circuit. It was time to let the world know who Kendrick Lamar was. Kendrick began recording Section 80. He even was able to have Dr. Dre in one of his recording sessions. He knew just from having Dr. Dre there that this had to be not only a classic, but it had to live up to all the dominant and dope West Coast albums that came before him. Kendrick and his team decided that the album's production had to sound distinct and it had to sound unlike anything that was out at the time. Very strategic to the point of like, we don't want to get boxed in. So mm -hmm. we're going to make every sound that we love into this one project so in the future 
You can never say he can't do that or he sounds weird on this mm. because we gave you Spiteful Chant. We gave you Keisha song. We gave Man. you all of these elements. ADHD. ADHD. Classics. All of these elements. So to this day, he can do whatever the hell he want to do. It's like strategic moves, like very strategic. Kendrick said this album was written for Generation Y. This was people born from 81 to 96, AKA millennials. He felt a need to address common themes and struggles for this generation. And then in your show, you played a lot of Tupac. What influence has he had on your music? Uh, too much. I mean, that's the person that made me decide to do my music real. You know I mean, I had to go back and visit everything that he stood for and say, you know what? Let me put my life and my music and touch these people out here because I'm a regular human individual just like them and we all go through the same stuff. So it made it a lot easier, a lot more comfortable for me to write when I, once I did that, you know. Everybody being real receptive to it, man. That's the type of issues I'm trying to bring back to the game. You know, because I feel for a long time it was watered down to what people was listening to all the time. They beat certain radio records over your head. That's all you're going to be confined to. That's all you're going to hear artists trying to make. So it's only going to be one. With the influence of Tupac, with Kendrick's memories of his childhood, his teenage years, and now in his 20s, and all the victories and losses in between that time, Kendrick crafted up a very special album, Section 80. Section 80 will release on July 2nd of 2011. Just starting with the album cover, you can see themes from the album you have a joint filled with Kush on a Bible that can be related to Kush and Corinthians, ADHD medication, you have Tammy's makeup, you have condoms that can be tied to Keisha's song, and then you have bullets which serves as the unwanted theme music you get to hear randomly when living in Compton. Kendrick would go on to say about the album cover that it's all the taboos of the world. Kendrick got a lot of criticism for the album cover. Basically, the duality of all these items aren't meant for the person that saved is what Kendrick was trying to point out. He also was saying that these items are human and a human can still have these items while still trying to find himself at the same time. Section 80 is built off of theme and narration that starts with the intro track F Your Ethnicity. With 16 tracks, Kendrick takes you on a roller coaster of artistry, pain, and pleasure. One of the best tracks is called No Makeup. It's very interesting how Kendrick finishes the sentence for the woman on the track. The song can be taken a couple different ways. On one way, he sees this beautiful girl and he's highlighting her inner beauty. And then the second way is it's also a bridge to a different track, which is track number 11. So the ending, the ending of the track, it leads to a world of prostitution. So the girl is saying that she's wearing so much makeup because she got a black eye. And at the end of the song, it's saying that the song will continue on track number 11. Song number 11 brings you to Keisha's song. It's about the unsavory world this woman has ended up in. It's really showing her human side, but it's also showing all the negative things that come in her line of work and all the things that she has to encounter. And it shows exactly how she got to this line of work. She ends up dying at the end of the song. This song is very important. It's a very important message. This song was supposed to end up on his next album, Good Kid, Mad City, but this song really fit perfectly with this album. The song is followed up on Kendrick's second album, Good Kid, Mad City, on the song that is probably one of Kendrick's best songs he's ever recorded, Sing About Me. Keisha's sister is narrating and is basically in the same line of work that her sister was in that she ended up dying in. This really shows the power of storytelling and how it can really shed light to the circumstances of the forgotten people of this, of this society. 
Kendrick did make it a point to showcase his lyrical skills on this album as well. That's nearly said. And you go in and what's that record where he was killing at the end of the um, thing? Rick and Morty. Rick and Morty. Where it was flow was speeding up? Yeah. I wish you had that, man. You must have had like a fucking aqua lung on. <laughs> In his nose while he was rhyming and shit, cause he just did the whole shit. Just yeah, kept going. Yeah. Crazy, it, crazy. Love. That's the The song Rigor Mortis would really add the balance and necessary lyrical prowess. That also shows that Kendrick is not only equipped with consciousness, but he has bars on top of it. And he also shows he has amazing storytelling. All these attributes are attributes of some of the greatest MCs that have come before him. The finale on the album is produced by, at that time, a fellow up-and-coming conscious MC by the name of J. Cole. Well, the first time I met with Kendrick on some, not met him, but the first time we got up on some music shit, um, I'm so, I was just so excited about the nigga. I gave him some of my, you know, I gave him beats or whatever, High Power was one of them. What a fucking song. High Power was one of them, which he killed and destroyed, and another one. When you would hear throw those threes in the air, it actually meant something. So high power, the three eyes were for heart, honor, and respect. High power is about a new movement for the new generation. Absol would go on to say that high power meant help lift the generation in a society that they view as destructive. With the endless array of albums, mixtapes, demos, freestyles, and extensive catalogs in the world of hip hop, it really showcases the beauty of the genre. Artists from various regions have left their mark, with some being discovered early on, others in the middle of their careers, and still others many years later. Whenever you may come across Kendrick Lamar's debut album, Section 80, it marked the beginning of his legendary journey as an artist.